All right. I'm going to share some statistics with you uh, that I found uh, that I thought were uh, interesting here. So, uh, in America, this is what it says. It says that uh, there's a Gallup poll taken, okay? And it says that 81% of Americans believe in God. 81%. Okay, it says that percentage has steadily decreasing with the highest recorded belief in God to be around 98% in the 1950s and 60s. 54% of people say they believe that they believe in the God as described in the Bible. So, but there's some other things that people believe about God that I thought were uh, interesting. <coughs> I'm pulling it up right now as well. It says, according to surveys, many people have a variety of beliefs about God. And this is from uh, Pew Research Center. 90% of Americans believe in a higher power, with 56% believing in the God of the Bible, and 33% believing in another higher power. According to the Pew Research Survey, Center survey, 48% of Americans believe that God determines what happens the most or all of the time. According to the Pew Research Center, Center nearly 8 in 10 Americans believe that God or a higher power has protected them. It says, according to an independent survey, nearly three quarters of Americans believe in life after death. This is Americans who identify with a religion are more likely to believe in God. While belief in God has declined in recent years, the United States remains a very religious country by the world's standards. So, belief in God, that's where we're going to begin uh, this morning. Um, we've been in the book of James and are continuing to be in the book of James until we finish it. But we've been talking about our faith and how our faith, what is evidence of our faith. And James has been telling us that faith without works is dead. Uh, that's where we've been before that, but he's going to move on to make another point. Um, before I was, I became a Christian when I was uh, 20 years old, right, right before I turned 21. Uh, and I had always believed in God. If you asked me if I got that survey, do you believe in God? I would say yes. If you asked me that I believe in the God of the Bible, I would say yes, but I, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I wouldn't know who that God was. So we all can have a belief in God, right? Uh, and we can all do a survey. But does belief in God make us a Christian? It doesn't, right? I mean, you can believe in God, and really, then you got to ask that person, well, what God do you believe in? Because we're talking about a higher power here. We're talking about the God of the Bible and, and different things like that. And uh, James is going to make a, a powerful, sobering point here uh, because most people, would, I would say, uh, very few people I've run into that don't believe in God. There are definitely some, but most people that I've been around have say they believe in God. But their lives don't reflect that, right? I, I said I believe in God. My life definitely didn't re reflect that. Uh, when you watch uh, award shows or something like that, and you see people with crosses around their neck, and, you know, they'll, you know, thank you, Jesus. You know, thank you, God, for this. Let's all get, get drunk, you know, and just contradicts what they've just proclaimed, or the God that they believe in. Uh, so James says this in James 2.19, this is where we're going to start. He says, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Now remember, the book of James is written for one of the purposes is for us to examine ourselves, to see if we are of faith, if we have a true and genuine living faith, or we have a dead faith. Or if we have a great faith or a weak faith. And he's given us several things, a way to examine that. And that's through trials, how we handle trials, um, how we respond, and, and how we receive God's word. And now he's talking about a belief in God. He says, you believe God is one, you do well, the demons believe in shudder. What is James' point? What's he make, what point is he making here? The knowledge is enough. You, know, you have to have a saving faith as well. Right. Right. 
right? There, there has to be evidence, right? There's evidence of her faith. He's taken part of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 here, and this is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, right? So he's taken a part of that, and he's quoting that right there. And this commentary is from John MacArthur, and I think it's very helpful for us to understand this section of Scripture. It says this, it says, you believe that God is one? James goes on to say, you do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. You do well carries a touch of sarcasm. It casts against an imaginary but universal common orthodoxy that is devoid of saving faith. Orthodox doctrine is no guarantee of salvation, James insists. Even the demons are orthodox in their sense of knowing and acknowledging the truth about God. Jewish orthodoxy was also centered in belief in the one true God. Where most Jews fell short was not on obeying the first, was in the following verse. So, not here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, but it was the second part of it. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says, which commands you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. James' point, as it were, is that belief in the truth of Deuteronomy 6.4 without obedience to 6.5 is worthless kind of belief. Like that, that, like that possessed by the demons. As far as factual doctrine is concerned, demon are monotheists, all of whom know that God is God. I'm sorry. All of whom know and believe that there is one true God. He goes on to say, There is also very much aware that Scripture is God's word, that Jesus Christ is God's Son, that salvation is by grace through faith, and that Jesus died and was buried and raised and atoned for the sins of the world. And that he ascended to heaven and is now seated at his father's right hand. They know very quite well that there's literal heaven and a literal hell. They doubtless have a clearly clear knowledge of the millennial and its related truths that does even the most devoted Bible scholar. So they have a great knowledge. And if you give them the checklist, they would say, check, check, check. Yes, they're checking those boxes. They have that belief. They have that knowledge. But we know that the demons are not saved, right? They're not saved. So a, a person can have knowledge and even agree, yes, that's true, but they're not saved. He goes on to say, but all the orthodox knowledge, divinely and eternally significant as it is, cannot save them. They know the truth about God and Christ and the Spirit, but they hate it, and even them. Orthodox doctrine is immensely better than heresy, of course, for it is true and points towards God and the way of salvation. But mere assent to it as true cannot bring a person to God into salvation. When James speaks of the demons shuddering, that means to bristle and to tremble, and was commonly used of the trembling associated with great fear. Demons, at least, have a sense to shudder at God's truth in a state of fear. For they know the eternal torment that awaits them in hell. In that regard, there is much more realistic and sensible than those whose false faith who think they will escape God's judgment by the shallow and superficial faith. So, they shudder, right? This is they shudder and they tremble. But remember in Matthew 7 when Jesus says, Many are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, right? Didn't we, uh, didn't I drive out demons in your name? Didn't I prophesy in your name? And what will Jesus tell them? He said, he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. But he goes on to talk about the, uh, the man who built the house, right? The man who built the house on the rock and the man who built the house on the sand. Uh, the wind and the waves came against both of them. Of course, the one that was built upon the rock withstood the storm, but the one that was built upon uh, the sand his house was destroyed and he talked about that the man who built the house upon the rock was the man who took God's word and heard it and he took it as it was and he was committed to living it out but the man who built the house on sand just picked and chose 
what they wanted to believe or what they wanted to obey. And so we see here that just because you may have some knowledge, and just so you may even agree with that, that's not a sense of security for you. Do you hold to it to be true? Are you committed to living it out? When you hear God's word, do you have a desire to respond to that? Or do you pick and choose? That's what he's, he's talking about there. So just because people believe, that doesn't mean anything. The demons believe. And that's what we must remember, that even the demons believe, but they're not going to heaven. Any comments about that before we move on to the next verse? Tim? I say, I say yeah, that's such an important like, distinction to be made for people who uh, claim that they know that there's a God. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them the follow-up question, well, are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? Everyone's going to say, well, I'm going to heaven, right? Yeah. No one is going to say, well, I'm going to go to hell. Right. So, and we know from the Bible that the majority of folks, unfortunately, yeah. are going to hell, right? Right. So, yeah, to, I think for James to really point that out, you know, up front and kind of make that distinction is, is key for a lot of people who you know, claim to know God, but they need to know that demons also know God, too. Right. That's exactly you're right. not going to be saved just by saying that you know God. You have to follow what Right. There should be evidence in your life. Again, that evidence doesn't save you. Our worst does not save us, but it's evidence that we are saved. There should be a, a result in your life. That's exactly true. Anybody else? No? Alright, well let's look, we'll look at verse 20. Because James is going to go on and say, but if you are willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless. Faith without works is useless. Foolish, it has the idea of empty or defective. Identifies anyone who opposes to truth that true saving faith produces works of righteousness. Useless carries the idea of fruitless and lack of productivity. We're going to look at an example of this in Scripture, of someone who is going to believe, they're going to acknowledge that this is true, and they're even going to follow in baptism. But you're going to find out that even though they they said they believed and they were even baptized, they did not know the Lord. And we'll see that in Acts 8, 5 through 20. It says this, And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes were one accord, were giving attention to what was said by Philip. As they heard, they saw signs which was he was performing. And in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. Many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was much more rejoicing in that city. Now there was a certain man named Simon, who had formerly been uh, practicing magic in that city, astonishing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were given attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. So you can imagine this guy is the star of the town, right? He is famous, and everybody uh, is coming to him, and he's well-respected and, and looked at. And so he has a, um, uh, a crowd, right, that, that, that's giving him praise and attention. So you can imagine this is happening here. Uh, Philip is teaching the truth, and, and uh, people are being saved, and this is going to get back to Simon. We'll see what happens. It says in um, verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 11. And they were giving him attention because he had a long, long time astonished them with his magic arts. So this has been going on for a long time. But when they believed Philip's preaching, the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Look at verse 13. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as they observed signs of great miracles taking place, and he was constantly amazed. So, remember, he was a magician. Right? He was a magician. So, I love magicians. Okay? Uh, I love magicians. I, I know there's no such thing as magic, but I love how they're able to make it appear that there's magic. You know, and I try, how do they do that? It just amazes me. Um, so, this guy is a showman. But what he's seeing is supernatural. 
it's real, right? And so you know he's he's jealous, right? Because he's able to; these guys are able to really do what they're doing. And so he's got a, he's got some big competition here, right? Because his crowd is dwindling because they're becoming followers of Christ. In verse fourteen, it says, "Now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John." Do you know why they sent Peter and John? Why did they send Peter and John down there? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. They they sent them down there to say because they're hearing these people are getting saved. They're like Samaritans. You know, we got to make sure this is real, right? So he sends them down there, and so they go down there. It says they came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And there's a reason why they haven't received the Holy Spirit. We'll see here in a minute. Verse 16. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them, for they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So, the Spirit was given to them. It was showing that they were truly saved. Okay, so that's why I hadn't fallen on them right then. That they were, when they came there, they received the Holy Spirit, and now everyone knows that this is genuine saving faith. That this is a real conversion. But verse eighteen. Remember our friend Simon. Now, when Simon saw the Spirit was bestowed them, laying on the hands of the apostles. He went there and what? Asked them to place their hands on him too, right? No. Look what he says. He offered them money. He offered them money, saying, Give this. He said, Give this authority to me as well, and so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So, He's not wanting the Holy Spirit. He's wanting that. He wanting to be able to give them the Holy Spirit, right? And he's trying to give them money to them. The problem. He wants this power. And do you think the power is to bring glory and honor to the Lord? No, it's not. It's for Him. And I'm saying He'll probably be charging people. I mean, this is just me reading into. He's probably going to be charging the fee. If you want the Spirit? You know, you're going to have to pay for it. Verse twenty. But Peter said to him. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Now listen to what he says in verse 21. You have no part or portion in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the, pray the Lord, if it is possible, that the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. Does that sound like a Christian? If I say you're in, you're in the gall of bitterness and you're in a bondage of iniquity, is that a safe person? That is not a safe person. Did he believe? Did he think it was true? He did. It says he did. Was he baptized? He was. Was he, he was a part of the congregation to follow them, right? But he was not saved. His actions proved that he was not saved. His desire to give money to get the gift to use for his own purpose was evidence that he was not saved. Vice versa. When we come to the Lord and we surrender to him and we want to live for him, our lives are going to be evidence that we're saved. That our faith is genuine. Simon's is not, and he's told that clearly. In verse 24, but Simon answered, said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing what you've said will come upon me. So he doesn't repent. Instead of him praying, he's like, You pray for me. Simon's belief, obviously, was not to salvation, it was merely a recognition that what Philip preached was true. He acknowledged about what well, God was correct, but God warned, but Peter warned him that his heart was not right before God, and that therefore he had no part in the working of the Spirit. He witnessed and declaimed. His faith was dead and worthless. Any comments about that? Questions about that? So we talk about the demons, they believe, they shudder, but they're not going to heaven. Now he's talked about, um, we looked at the, the, a Simon who's, who had a faith, but his faith was useless because it was just a belief. It was a shallow belief. There's no obedience behind it. 
Now, James is going to take us to give us an example. Uh, an example of true saving faith. Right? And he's going to choose Abraham. And he's going to move from Abraham to Rahab. And this morning, we're going to focus on Abraham. It says, verse 21 of James 2. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now that sentence alone, enough I've said, was not Grant justified by works? That caused you to go, what? You know, was not Caitlin justified by works? That's how he starts it off, okay? So, you can see maybe this, what, what's he saying here? He says, was he not justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And was a result of works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So let's talk about Abram, or Abram, Abraham, whichever one you want to call him. Justified by works. Well, let's look at Genesis 12, at this man who was justified by his works. Then Pharaoh called Abram, and said, What is this that you've done to me? Why did you tell me that your wife was why did you tell me that she was your wife? What's he what's he done here? He's told that Sarah, his wife, is his sister. Why did you not say she's my why did you say she's my sister? So I took her for my wife. Now then, here's your wife, take her and go. So Abram lied. They were uh, the Egyptians, he thought the Egyptians are gonna see how beautiful she is. They're going to take me out so they may have her. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to lie and say that you're my sister. Right? So he's lying. Instead of trusting God, he, he lies. Well, you think that after you've done that, you realize, hey, I'm not going to do that again. Right? But no, he's like us. He continues on in the sin in verse 20. Now, Abram's journey uh, towards the land of I don't know how to say that, but that's where he went. And he settled down in Kadesh, and Sir, and Sir journeyed to Jarir. I don't know if that's right. But verse 2, And Abraham said to Sarah's wife, She is my sister, so Ahimelech the king, is it, how you say it, Ger, is it, how's that said? Gerar. Gerar, thank you. Sent and took Sarah. So what does he tell Abimelech? She's my sister. He goes back. He pulls it out. She's my sister. Again, because he's, he does he doubts God. So this is a man who's a liar. Right? He just didn't lie once, he's lied twice. So <clears throat> is he justified by that work? Of course not. In verse 16, remember Abram, Abram was promised that he was going to be the father of many, be a great nation. And of course that nation would come from Sarah, his wife. But... Verse 16, or chapter 16 of 1 and 2 of Genesis says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had born no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, perhaps, that she may obtain children through her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So now what has Abram done here? What has he done? He's, he's, he's committed adultery, right? He has a wife. He's committed adultery. Now his wife is telling him to do it, but he listens, and he does it. And who came of this? Who, who were the children of Hagar? Israel. Right. And they were going to be a thorn in the Jewish side, the Jew, Jew side forever, right? So they, he's just... He's called a big uh, happening here has gone on. He's this, disobedient. This is like going to the day's time. Yes, that's that's exactly right. It's not, it's yes, not that's exactly right. And so we see here, we have a liar, and now we've got an adulterer. And this man was justified by his works, right? That could not be what it's, it's saying there, right? But let's look at the example that James uses, which is a powerful example Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Now it came about that these things that God tested Abraham. 
and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering, and then rose and went to the place that God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes, saw the place from a distance, and Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go yonder, and will worship and return to you. So the Lord has told him what? To sacrifice his son, right? And so how does Abraham respond? Huh? With faith. Immediately, it says he got up the next morning, they get the wood going, and they head off, right? And when him and the lad, his son, are going off, him and Isaac, he tells the men to what? To wait there. That what's going to happen? They're going to come back. Now, where is he? What's he going to do when he goes with this wood and his son? He's going to sacrifice him, right? That's what the Lord has told him. But yet we see him making a statement, we're going to come back. So what do you think is going on in the mind of Abraham? He's trusting him, right? Like if he's sacrificing him, like I said, he'll, what, he'll resurrect him, right? They're coming back. They're coming back. In verse 6, and Abraham took the, the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took his hand, uh, he took his hand, uh, the fire and the knife. <coughs> so the two of them walked together, and Isaac and Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said to him, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but the lamb for the burnt offering. He's asking, Where's that at? And Abraham said to him, God will provide for himself the lamb of the burnt offering, my son. So is Abraham lying again to Isaac? Not wanting to tell him, you are the lamb. What is he stating there? God's going to provide. But he doesn't know how he's going to provide, right? But he has a faith he's going to provide. Even if that lamb is Isaac, and he does what the Lord says, he knows the Lord's not going to abandon him. The Lord is going to resurrect him. He goes on to say, so the two of them walked together, and they came to the place which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there. They arranged the wood, and he bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. You know, this is a lot about Abraham, but to me this is a lot about Isaac. It doesn't say his dad chased him down. It says he bound him. So it seems... That he is submissive. Right? So he bounds him. He lays him on the altar of wood. And as a father, I just can't, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine it. But again, he's filled for the Holy Spirit, or he's empowered by the Holy Spirit. At this point, he is doing what God tells him to do. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took his knife to slay his son. So it's going to happen. That's the intention of his heart. He does. I wonder why he trusted God in this incident, but not the other two incidents. <laughs> That's a great, but it's like us. You know what I'm trying to say? It's like, uh, like I, I know. It's like us. We trust God for our salvation, but then we worry about little things. You know what I'm trying to say? We trust him for the greatest thing, but we're worried about everyone falls short. Yeah, but I, it's a great example. But you remember Elijah? He had all the faith to call down fire from heaven, you know what I'm saying, and, and mocking the, the prophets of Baal, then he kills them all, and then he hears about Jezebel, and he runs and hides and wants to die. You remember that? I mean, we see these people, but it reminds us, it's us. I mean, he almost sounds like we, it is so us. There's nobody that's perfect all the time, and Abraham definitely isn't. And it, there's a, you know, he's using him as a great example of faith. I mean, he, when you look at Hebrews 11, you know, the... The uh, faith hall of fame, if you will, Abraham's mentioned in that, right? He's mentioned as as one of the great men of faith, but he also had great failure. He goes on to say, um, 
But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, and he goes again, here I am. Here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him. For I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. And it said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven, and he said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing. You have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and the sand which is the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies, and your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So we see Abraham's trust in God, his faithfulness. The Lord did provide, and the Lord again is going to bless him. It reminds him of the blessing that he's going to give him. Uh, this commentary here says, Was not Abraham our father justified with works when he offered his son of Isaac, uh, his son on the altar? The first phrase of that verse 21 was a stumbling block to Martin Luther when it says that he was justified by faith. He was so adamantly opposed to the Roman Catholic dogma of salvation through works and so strongly defender of the truth of salvation by grace alone through faith alone that he completely missed James' point calling the entire writing an epistle of straw. James was not contradicting the doctrine of salvation by faith. He was not dealing with the means of salvation at all, but rather with its outcome, the evidence that had genuinely occurred. After establishing the absence of good works, proves that a professed faith is not real and saving, but rather is deceptive and dead. He then emphasized the corollary truth that genuine salvation, which is always the only God's Grace working through man's faith in Italy will be demonstrated outwardly in the form of righteous deeds. Abraham is the model of saving faith for both the Jew and the Gentile. A man whose faith was living and accepted and accepted to God. Because fallen man is morally and spiritually bankrupt with no reckoning merit at all before God. Nothing he can possibly do in himself and by his own power can make him right and accept. It is through a faithful response to his grace. It is not that in the Old Testament men were saved through the law and that the New Testament are saved by faith. At whatever point in unfolding the revelation of the work of God, men may have lived or will ever live. God requires nothing of them for salvation except for true faith in him. Hebrews 11 makes it abundantly clear that before and after the law was given at Sinai, salvation was by faith. And if you look at this, this is before his sacrifice of of Isaac, it's in Genesis 15, 16, it says, Abraham believed the Lord, Moses tells us, and he erected him to righteousness. In Romans 4, 2 through 5, it says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is reckoned to him as favor, but the but what was due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned to him as righteousness. When we talk about that word, when it says Abraham was justified by his works, justified is the key word that we need to understand there. Because there's two meanings to that word. And we're used to the first one, and not so much to the second one. And this commentary will explain this. It is important to understand that the Greek verb trend, justified has two general meanings. The first pertains to acquittal, that is, declaring and testing a person as righteous. That is meaning in relationship to salvation. That's what we're used to finding. We're here justified. We've been justified by God. The second meaning of justified pertains to vindication or proof of righteousness. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? He explains, Abraham's supreme demonstration of that justification occurred when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar, which, as noted above, happened many years after his justification by faith recorded in Genesis 15 6. 
It was when he offered up Isaac that the whole world could perceive the reality of his faith. It was genuine rather than spurious, uh, obedient rather than deceptive, living rather than dead. Although God commanded from Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his son, it threatened to obligate his promise of blessing the world specifically through Isaac and also contradicted what Abraham knew. I pause here while I come to sit with these papers. <coughs> to be prohibition of human sacrifice or form of murder. The patriarch trusted God implicitly without question or wavering. In John 8, 56-58, this is what it says about Abraham. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. This is Jesus speaking. The Jews therefore said to him, You're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Despite his limited theological knowledge, Abraham's trust in the Lord was sufficient to count him out to belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, and the Savior of the world. Like all true believers who lived before Christ, who died in faith without receiving the promise, Abraham nevertheless was enabled by God to understand that the Savior would come to fulfill God's promise and welcome them from a distance. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, we're told of this. And this greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been, to, you've been stressed by various trials. And we know that trials uh, can be also testings. And it talks about how Abraham's faith was tested, that God tested him. Verse 7 says that the proof of your faith be more precious than gold, which is powerful, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Abraham was not a perfect man, and we looked at that and saw that either in faith or in his works. After many years, he passed without Sarah having promised heir. He took matters in his own hands, having his son Ishmael, by Hagar, his, his uh, wife's maid. His wavering trust in the Lord took, led to commitment to adultery. Then it turned to uh, creation of the Arab peoples, who since that time have become a continuing thorn in the side of the Jews, God's chosen people through Isaac. In those and other instances, such as twice by lying about Sarah being his sister, James' point is this, in the overall pattern of life, Abraham's faithful was faithfully vindicated by saving faith through his many good works, above all, above all else by offering Isaac. When a man is justified before God, he will always prove that God he will always prove that justification I'm sorry. <clears throat> Abraham is faithfully vindicated in the same faith through his many good works, above all else, by offering Isaac. When a man is justified before God, he will always prove that justification before other men. A man who has been declared and made righteous will live righteously. Imputed righteousness will manifest practical righteousness. In other words, of John Calvin, faith alone justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. And in the words of an unknown poet, let all who hold this faith, hope and holy deeds abound. Thus faith approves itself sincere, active, virtue crowned. Well, how was Abraham described? He was described as a friend of God. A friend of God. In 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 27, 20 verse 7 says, Does, does that now not, O Lord, or O God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy people Israel, and give to its descendants of Abraham thy friend forever. In Isaiah 41, 8, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, for I have chosen descendants of Abraham, who, my friend. <clears throat> Due to his belief and resulting obedience, Abraham was called the friend of God. What dignity, honor, and joy, because his faith was genuine, was therefore manifested and proven. He entered wonderful fellowship with those whom God calls his friends. The basis of that true friendship was Abraham's obedience. His justification by works, just as his father in just as his father of the faithful, he might also be called the father of the obedient, because those two godly characteristics are inseparable. And Jesus tells us in John fifteen fourteen, You are my friends if you do what I command. So that again is when we look at the book of James. That's true saving faith. That our faith is evident by the lives that we live. Our 
fa our lives are the exclamation point to what we believe. Faith alone is useless. But it will, true faith will produce fruit. It will produce evidence of our faith. Any questions or comments? I hope this was beneficial to you. It was encouraging me. And I see the faith of Abraham. And I'm like, I just can't imagine it. But he was faithful. And he encourages me to be all the more faithful. And um, also it gives me comfort to know that, you know, when I fail, you know, I don't surprise God. You know, God knows. And he's not done with me, right? You know, just like when Peter denied him. You know, Jesus said, you're going to deny me. Times not, but I pray for you, Peter, that your faith will not fail. When you return, strengthen your brothers. So he wasn't surprised. His, God's not surprised at our failure, but I don't want to fail, and I know you don't want to fail either, but uh, we just keep striving for him, keep reaching for the prize, and one day this race is going to end, right? And we're going to be with the Lord forever. And, uh, our faith will be perfect. Any questions? <coughs> Comments? So you got anything? Okay. I'll let your turn to move over here if you would like. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your truth. We are so thankful that it's you who begun this work in us, and it's you that's going to complete it. Father, we see that and we know that, Father, we're not um, practically righteous in our everyday life. Positionally, we are in Christ. But, Father, because that... Uh, because Christ lives in us, the Holy Spirit is in us, we're going to produce fruit. And I just pray that we would just be continued faithful to be obedient to the, the call in our life. As I think about when you spoke to Abraham, he would say, here I am, Lord. I pray that that would be said of us, that we would say the same thing. Here we are, Lord. Well, how would you use us today, Father? Father, we're, we're, we look forward to the day when we meet you in the air and we're forever changed. Father, we know that before that happens, you've got a race that you marked out for each of us. And each of our courses are different. But Father, it's the same spirit that lives in us and empowers us to, to run this race. And I pray that we keep our eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of our faith. So, Father, we just pray this morning as, as we go out into the sanctuary that John, as he comes to proclaim your word, that you'll just use him as your instrument, Father. Father, as that word goes out, it will accomplish its purpose. We'll see ourselves if we're looking in a mirror, Father. And I pray that we just wouldn't look in a mirror and forget what we look like and go and live our lives like normal, but we would look intently to your perfect law and just allow the Spirit to work in us, to shape and mold us into the image of Christ, to renew our minds to be transformed our lives. That people come in contact with us, Father, they would, they would know that they've experienced God you, that, that, that you are living through us and it's evident. Father, we don't have to speak it. It's the, by the way that we live. Father, when given the opportunity to speak, we would. So, Father, if there's someone here today that does not know you, or maybe there's someone today that, maybe they, they made a profession, maybe they've said a prayer, but, uh, Father, they're like Simon. They, they maybe even believed and they've been baptized, but, uh, Father, their lives are far from you. I just pray that you'd open their eyes to the bondage of sin and you would drag them to yourself you grant them saving faith, that they be born again, that they become part of this church family, Father, where they could grow and be edified and develop their spiritual gifts and edify others. Father, I pray that you be David and the choir as they praise him as they lead us in song and as we sing the lyrics to these songs, that we're not just mouthing the words, that we're, you know, we're really listening to what we're singing back to you. Because you and you alone are worthy of our praise, Father. I pray that you take away all distractions and hinder us from worshiping properly and ask your blessing upon our time of fellowship and our time of giving. And I pray that you be with Miss Jackie. She leads children's church and be with those who are loving our children in the nursery. In Christ's name, amen.